It is the week before Classic Week, so a perfect time to have a mega show. Tonight, we have three guests. Combined, they have 62 Bassmaster Classic qualifications. Eight of those classics they've won. Nine Angler of the Year titles. 241 top tens. And one of them just caught the biggest bass ever caught on Bass Live. Rick Clun, Kevin Van Dam, and Justin Hamner join me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks, and my humpers. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Welcome into the 152nd edition of the Mercer Podcast and... Um, this one's a good one. This one is a mega show. When I was a little kid, Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage came together, and they were the mega powers. Well, that yeah, is a great explanation of what we're going to see here on tonight's show. An incredible show. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know how it came together, to be honest. Um, sometimes you just take a shot and... Things come together, and if I was better at my job, two episodes ago was our 150th episode, and it would make sense that, like, hey, for 150, let's have a special show with three guests and the Mega Powers. No, no, I I can't be normal, so that'd be too predictable. So for show 152, we have brought the Mega Powers together, and ironically, the original concept for this show was to have multiple guests and I want to hear your feedback on that if you like to have a lot of guests firing through it or you like the longer ones because after we started a lot of people gave us feedback and said hey I like the longer podcast where we can just focus on one person well we went pretty long with everybody um uh, <laughs> I mean, it is Clunday, Clunday, Clunday. So he said he'd stop by every month, and he is there this week. We're going to talk to Justin Hamner. Before we get into Hamner, some of the stuff Clun says in this conversation is amazing, and it's truly why Rick Clun is who he is. So you're going to love that. We're also joined by Justin Hamner, who just caught the biggest bass in Bass Live history in 11-7 on Lake Fork, and that one goes in a lot of different directions. And then we have a quick visit from my buddy KVD. He has the whole world abuzz, the whole bass fishing world abuzz, wondering what's going on. What, what is the big announcement? We talk about it quickly on today's show. And, and the good news is, not just today's show, but KVD's coming back in a couple of weeks. But this is the Mega Power Show. I would love to keep talking and, and say things, but let's just jump right into it. And for our first guest... He's Justin Hamner. Justin Hamner. First of all, I'm pissed off. I mean, I know your wife painted that beautiful picture and everything, and you need to be behind it in every podcast. But when we talked, you said you were going to do this on a friggin' tractor. What the hell happened? The audio kept cutting out when I, I was on the tractor. It's terrible service. Was it your I racing tractor? Yeah. The one I'm going to pull my boat through in the classic. Wouldn't that be awesome? Do you do you think that have Toyota you ever... sticker on it? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that. I, would, I mean, that is a beautiful picture that your wife painted, though. But I mean, thank you. I've seen it on it, a lot. It's of like podcasts. a halo around my head. It really is. You can't tell that. It, what kind of thank flower you. is it? It just looks like your brain's exploding if you sit just right. <laughs> what what is that? Is that a, a daisy? I have no idea. Not a uh, clue. The cover of the flower. Let's just have that stuff coming out of your head. Is that a <laughs> perfect visual depiction of what it felt like to catch an 11-7 on Lake Fork? Yeah. My mind just did explode. That was – did you see that fish? Uh, yeah. I've, I've seen it oh a few gosh. times. I, I've watched that video like at least 100 times. It's like, yeah, that oh. really happened. All by me. yourself in the bathroom, just you in the video? Yeah. How else are you going to watch it? <laughs> <That's>... 
I oh mean, my goodness, that was awesome. <laughs> I mean, dude, that that tournament in general was just ridiculous. Um, but an eleven seven. I mean, is that by far your biggest bass ever? I've never caught a ten pounder. I guess I still haven't caught a ten pounder. <laughs> but <laughs> screw that, ten. That's what I. Yeah, let's just go straight to eleven. That's what I was saying the whole time. I mean, me and my camera, we had so much fun. But it's like I, I got to get a double digit. I mean, this is just—it's too dumb of a week. And then when I caught that one, I mean, it was like, okay, this is happening. I mean, I started to like break down, like, okay, this is it. This is happening. And then I realized I have a three pounder still. Oh crap! I still got a fish. <laughs> Did uh, did you cry after that fish? Maybe, maybe a little bit. Yes, I did. You did it, like it was like yeah. what kind of tears? Are we talking just like a a classy I, little teardrop? Or are we talking snot bubbles I, coming out of your nose? Oh no, I don't know if tears actually like came out of my eyes, but like it was definitely one of those like choked up trying to hold it back kind of moments, and you know where the camera gets like really really close in your face. It was one of those moments. It's the biggest bass ever caught on Bass Live, which, I mean, Dang you right talked to is. your parents during the tournament because um, they were very nervous. They, pay- they said that you had to win, and unfortunately, you didn't. So you <laughs> let them down again. again. <laughs> it's just the ongoing theme in my life. <laughs> but you had a great event, and we're going to see that fish for, well, ever. I mean, you look at all those giant fish catches. And you're one of them, dude. Like like the Gerald Swindle giant fish in California. He ate it. He got it. Like all those oh Godzilla gosh. ain't got nothing on me, Greg Hackney. You're one of those. If you had to do it over again, I would wish you I would have said something stuff? cooler. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was the whole time, just, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And then watching, I'm like, dude, shut up. Say something cool. This is your moment. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> is that really what it feels like though? Like to like I mean, I imagine just growing up loving the sport that like do you even think about stuff like that or is it you're just so distracted by the fish you forget where you even are? I forget where I am. Like, yeah, I'd be lying if I didn't say I haven't practiced Godzilla ain't got nothing on me <laughs> and try to come up with something cooler. But in the moment when this actually happened and that fish actually came up, I mean I'm from Alabama. We ain't used to nothing like that. It's like a, you know, four or five pound spotted bass. It's like, okay, cool. That's a good one. Freaking 11 pounder comes wallering at the top. And I'm speechless. <laughs> I think that was the one thing I did say. Is like, I can't breathe. I, yeah, I love it. It was an incredible fish, an incredible tournament, incredible year for you so far. Two events in. You're sitting in fourth place for Progressive Bassmaster yeah. Angler of the Year. Were you excited about kicking it off in Louisiana and Texas in two big bass factories before the season started? Um, those were the two I was most worried about. 100%. Really? I'm not good at catching big fish, <laughs> even though I just <laughs> set the record. <laughs> for That's what's the craziest part about this is Having 124 pounds and some change, I I have always been the guy that just like consistent. I'll go catch your 15 to 18 pounds, and it usually does pretty good everywhere. And then the first two times we were, you know, we came to Fork, I caught that 15 and 18 pounds, and it it didn't get me to day three. <laughs> so it, that's what's kind of weird. Is I guess I figured out how to catch some big fish. I don't know. What did you change? Honestly, it's all been like the mental attitude. Like really? A hundred percent. I know everybody says it's such a mental sport, mental game. If you ain't got it mentally right, you ain't hitting on much. <laughs> and last year was actually my first year to actually get out of the lawnmower racing grass cutting you know having three other jobs and just like strictly start focusing on bass fishing 100 percent. and this off season i fished more than i've ever fished like i that's all i did every day and i think it's gonna show well, has, 
It has so far. And I mean, I, I think that's one of the most understated things. Like when people have, and it doesn't matter what job, but when you have another job, I mean, you just can't fully focus in, in it. I know there's people hearing this be like, well, I need another job. Well, yes, I get that. But, but when you take yep. that, I mean, the old saying, you can't steal second with with your foot on first. Did, so how did that mentally, so many people, when they do that, they go the opposite direction where they all of a sudden, I mean, you have a wife, a kid, I mean, you got pressures on you, but they go the opposite where that, so how did, how did it change for, for you? Like when you say the mental, did you do anything different or is it just simply like, I ain't got another lot more racing is in my past. It was, I mean, honestly, it's the financial burden that yeah. we get put under when we start this and thank God for, you know, the people that's actually cared enough about me to support me. I mean, dude, that takes off such a weight. It's unreal. I mean, my first year when I started, I, I think I got like seven thousand dollars of sponsorship, and then the rest was out of pocket that I did not have. <laughs> like, no doubt about it, I was living off of if I can get this, you know, make this cut. And when you start making decisions like that, just trying to make the cut, I mean, everybody know Polinick says that if you're shooting for that cut line, it's like you always get right below it. If you're shooting for first every time you usually don't get right below it and it's going to be a heck of a year. But it, I mean, it's that mentality of like, I'm not thinking about anything else now. I'm thinking about fishing and winning and I don't have all these stressful stuff worrying about what's going on back home. You know, me and my wife really got in the groove of figuring out how to like manage when I'm gone with my little girl, you know, dude, that was that hard. Was tough. It, it's tough. Like when you're gone and I mean, you do FaceTime calls at night and she's sitting there like crying, asking when you're coming home and you still got two freaking weeks before you see her again. That's brutal. But now, you know, kind of got that worked out. It's the worst part about the sport. I mean, honestly, like if, if, if somebody would just invent a teleporting machine where you could just do your job and then go home at night. It, yeah, what are but you doing? Be in a way. I mean, I'm not. You're counting on me to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not your you guy. Got a shot at me. I move the hole that makes the words. That's all I got. I mean, if the world ends, <laughs> I'm the least likely. Like you think, if the world goes to zombie world, nobody wants me. I mean, guess what? I'll do. I'll announce you, and, and we'll get found quicker. It's like you would like really pump us up to get us going against these zombies. <laughs> Yeah, you, I could do that. <laughs> you would rally a movement. There's no doubt. <laughs> uh, how has the reaction from the industry, from sponsors and stuff, been from from this start to the season? It's been so good. I ain't going to lie. It's been good. Like All of my sponsors are more than happy. I mean, it's like. Oh, you know how to catch fish. Well, maybe we'll actually help you out more now. <laughs> Instead of just this beautiful face. Uh, you, did, know it. you did make yourself self-professed sexiest man on tour. Do you believe you are still that? Yeah. Is it going to be Matt? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Matt, Matt thinks so. But, but, I mean, hey, we'll leave it up. We to all you. think so. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of beautiful men on tour. That's why they're on the Bassmaster Elite Series. That's what I think. <laughs> How different is this job? You grew up wanting to do this, right? Like, uh, I mean, oh, your absolutely. your Bassmaster bio says that in school you wanted to be like Jay Yellis. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. When I was Jay's like in – It's awesome, man. When I think it was like fifth grade, we had to, you know, write a report, and that year was the year that he won the Classic. Yeah. So it's like, of course I got to do it in Alabama, you know, on the Alabama river and everything. Yeah, I definitely. So but now that that's all I've thought about <laughs> forever. Yeah. Like, no I was the kid when I was like 11 or 12 years old. My dad was taking me to the baseball, you know, having to do all that. And I'm sitting in the back seat, like literally crying because I just wanted to go fishing. He's like, you just got to finish this last year. And then you won't have to play baseball anymore. 
And so I take, sucked at it. I take you were very good at baseball, huh? <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. But it goes back again. That All I cared about was fishing. You know, that's all I wanted to do. How does this job compare to what you visualized when you were that kid throwing a temper tantrum in the back seat because you had to do physical activity? Better. <laughs> it's better. Really? Yeah, there's there's sucky parts of leaving my family. I have no doubt about it. I, but, dude, I'm fishing for a living. It still doesn't seem real, and I love it. Like, I'm getting to experience the greatest bodies of water at, like, the best times. We always do so good with the scheduling and all this stuff. But, dude, I get to travel around the country and catch bass. It's better than I thought. It's good to hear that because – obviously social media obviously podcast boy they fuel a lot of i mean through negativity and we've heard a lot of it this year does that frustrate you to hear people you know in your same you know you're loving it but there is people yeah. that that make this seem doom and gloom i do not get that it, it does that i don't let anything like really bother me but i yeah. don't understand it i'll say that it's like I'm very confused what you're doing because everybody knows the hard work and stuff that we put into getting here. If you don't absolutely love what you're doing, you're not going to make it. And to hear so many people complain that have made it, I don't know. There's a lot of folks that want to take your spot. That's the truth. That is the truth. You and uh, Patrick, are you and Patrick still roommates? Yeah. Absolutely. Are you gonna be are you gonna be roommates if you keep being such a thorn in his side with that angler of the year race? I'm gonna we talked about that yesterday. Really? We want to go one and two. We just haven't decided who's gonna be one. Dude, it would be so he's really good, good at like being you second be like, and third, he's number though. two. I'm number one. <laughs> well, he's number crazy. two, and you know what number two is, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I want to be the shit. Yeah, I mean, that's not bad. That's not a bad thing to be. Um, wow. Well, what is it like? I mean, you're catching them now, and you're doing really well now. I mean, you're going to fish your second classic in a couple of weeks. But you did have a tougher year while rooming with him, and dude has never had a freaking – it feels like – I mean, he was born with a bass – on the end of the line, like it's ridiculous how oh he, gosh. you look at his career, there is yet to be a doubt. Like, I mean, we talk about the smallmouth thing. Well, clearly he figured that out because he is the he most weight ever out. in a smallmouth event. That's scary, isn't it? But like, there is no, I mean, he's been perpetual top 10 for Angler of the Year. Did that frustrate you at times? No, not at all. It just showed me what I'm doing wrong because, I mean, he is, we share everything. There's no, like, secrets. We're not holding back from each other. He he was just mentally so much better. When he decides it's time to make a decision, there's no second guessing. I mean, he can pull up to a spot, make three casts, and it just not feel right. And if we could ever figure out what that feel right actually is, I don't know if it's like a little tingle in your butt or what, but – it's a magical feeling. But whenever he feels that, he's gone. He's no second guessing. He makes decisions on the fly so much quicker, and it, that's all it is. Whereas me, I was slowly, you know, like I might get to that at, say, 1 o'clock at the end of the day, and we come back and like, oh, yeah, we figured this out. He's like, yeah, I figured that out at 7.45. What were you doing till 1 o'clock? It, it's just the decision-making so much faster with him. It's freaking good. Do you – so how, how do you how do you fix that? How do you speed up? You know what I mean? If you're waiting for a feeling or what? Yeah. Like how how did you change that? Did you more time on the water of yeah. getting and getting more comfortable with myself making those decisions? I like I think that's one of the biggest things. Like the last I don't know six or seven tournaments, however many. It's like I've will start on my starting spot that I find in practice that I think is good. Usually it's crap. To be honest, I don't know where the fish are going, but I'm not worried about it. And I'm leaving. And every single day 
of, I mean, at Fork and Toledo, I never, I fish new water every day. Day one of the tournament didn't matter. I went to my starting spot, was there maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And then after that, I went and found the water because it just wasn't working. So, why is your first spot always crap? I don't know. It's so good in practice. They'll just be loaded. And I'll get all excited, you know, and I get there and it's just like, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, me and Patrick actually started on the first spot at Toledo. I was like, there is so many big fish here. Like, we can both get good in a hurry. We both started there. And <laughs> both of us was gone by 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> He's never going to trust me again for a first spot. <laughs> <laughs> so you convinced him to go there? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, totally wasted an hour of his day. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was my first move towards you know trying to take him down for AOY. Well, yeah, I mean it's going to be a, a long, long, <laughs> arduous battle, and little moments like that. I mean, an hour away is an hour away. I mean, yep. defensive fishing, I guess they call it. Uh-huh. What? Uh, what is your mind like going into the Bassmaster Classic? I mean, you've been there before. You've been in the Super Six. You saw how awesome of an experience that is. What? Well, how's this one different? Oh, it, for one, I think I know what to expect now. As far as the week, that week is nuts. Next week's gonna be crazy, like all the media stuff, all that. But like, kind of know what to expect now. But two Grand Lake fishes, like. If there was ever a lake to like put it right up in my alley, that's it. Like really? it's jerk bait, jerk baits and jigs. Yeah, I like jerk baits and jigs, and it's kind of set up perfect. Pre-spawn a year, favorite time to fish. I don't know. Anytime there's a jerk bait bite going though. How much time have you spent on Grant? None. <laughs> Never seen it. <laughs> So that's why it's even better. <laughs> You're expecting like, oh yeah, I've been there 17 times. No. Well, I mean, you, you, but all the... you really sold me on all the like um, spending tons of time on the water. So I'm like, well, this dude's yeah, got hundreds of hours in water. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it from all the research I've done and everything, like even when um, Ed won one or when Cliff Pace won, even watching that when I was like growing up, it was like, that looks just like my home lake. They're fishing just like how I like to fish. And it's like, I haven't really changed that much on the style of fishing and what I look for and how I find fish. It's just, that's up perfect. I don't know. I might be dead last, but I got a good feeling about it. Are you looking forward to one of the things that I, that I underestimated, I think until I, spend enough time in the elite series and talk to you guys. It's kind of a free event in the way that like, you don't have that pressure. Like, you know, you can be hero or zero and you may as well be because there's no points, you know, a 10th yeah. place. I mean, you, if you're going to be 50th, be 50th, but, but do the stuff that it, that can potentially get you the win. Do you, do you feel that in the classic? hundred percent. I think that's why I did good on my first one to be honest with you going into it is like yeah it's the classic but i wasn't nervous at all about it i was nervous about all the media and all this stuff because i'm not good with the whole moving the hole for words or whatever you say <laughs> moving the hole that makes the words oh yeah that's it that's it no um but the, the fishing part i was not nervous at, about it all like just Go fish and have fun. And I think it showed. So come do the same thing. This is freaking fun. Do, do you really not think you're good at the moving the hole that makes the words? I am terrible at Have you seen me on stage? A lot. <laughs> yeah. Most, most of the time you've been up there. Woo. <laughs> I'll get back and like call my wife afterwards. And she's like, you did, did good fishing today, at least. <laughs> Uh, Thanks, babe. So, so do you do you actually get nervous when you come on stage? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what to say. 
I always have something planned and I've, I I don't think I don't think I've ever actually said what I had planned. I have such some really good funny stuff planned. But it never happens. Never. Never. You'll ask me a question and just like it cuz it'll be a softball question just sets up perfect. It's like uh pretty much all I got. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think there's Sorry. a lot of guys that feel like that in the elite series? Like, I don't know. It's a, it, it's a weird part Swindle of the job. definitely does. He has no idea what to say. Yeah, no, he's a mess up there. <laughs> he's terrible at it. <laughs> Gosh. It is a weird part of the job, though. Like, I mean, if you had to like baseball better, I mean, they, they get mad if they if you ask the coach a question during it. But you guys are literally like that 11-7. I mean, dude, you're fighting a fish. You're you're in the heat of – like, could you imagine if in baseball, that's like literally somebody running back to catch the fly ball, and they're talking to you. Like, I think pro yeah. anglers are put in a weird position routinely. Like, it's just how our sport works. Yeah, and I think that's why there is – there's some interesting characters on the lead series. Really? <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. Have you ever met Steve Kennedy? I have. I have. <laughs> that is, I love him. That might be my favorite guy, like ever. But yeah, it, it's it's so weird the different sides of stuff that we have to do. I suck at social media. Like that whole, I guess anything social, what it comes down to, terrible at. <laughs> so you, but like on a personal level of like talking with people, dude, we're good. But then you put me up in front of a crowd or like, you know, audience stuff. I don't and I'm getting more comfortable with it. Like I like trying to get the crowd like fired up. Yeah. Which we need to talk about for the classic. Oh we're gonna get the crowd we fired up for the out. classic? Yeah. I just need some ideas. Oh. Okay. So I I'll work on some of those for you. Why do you find <laughs> I was Steve? thinking like t shirt cannon. Dude. Would that be cool? I I have wanted one for a long time because I'm a weirdo that would love to shoot one of those. But the problem is, I just want to shoot them. They're not as cool as you think. They're not as cool as you think. Like, I mean, there's oh. n because I mean, you got to jam a shirt down in the can. I mean, this is a horrible gesture to make <laughs> on screen. So you just uh, did this, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, your gestures Sorry. so much worse than. If you're listening to the audio version of this, this is one section of the show you want to check out on YouTube. <laughs> trust me. But you you shoot said shirt, but you need to like reload said shirt. <laughs> There's not one like Please if there was an auto that. cannon. Like if we get if somebody's listening right now and you're in the shirt cannon business and you've like you can load ten of them and <laughs> that yeah. would be so much cooler. But I feel like you know you shoot one and <laughs> and you really make one person happy and piss everybody else off, and then you're like, hold <laughs> on, like ten minutes later you're still. <laughs> It's a weird, weird situation, but uh, uh, hey, I think you'd accept it. Be cool. Get a shirt cannon. I, or, I guess I just need to come out to the one pop and then just start slinging them. Yeah, or if you no, you're not good at that. Clearly, you had a temper tantrum not to go to baseball, so I'm sure you're not a, don't have a good arm. <laughs> Hand it to the upper <laughs> level, knock out a kid on the first row. <laughs> What does that feel like? So that real moment. Quick story about that. Oh yeah, please. That whole baseball deal. So um, I was like eleven or twelve. Obviously, it was my last year, and um, we were terrible. Like we were bad. The whole team. and we had. Oh yeah, we were awful, and we had one good, like really, really good pitcher. Well, he got hurt, so then we were down to like nothing. The coach literally looked around to everybody when we were about to go out on the field and said, does anybody want to pitch? And, and I'm, you know, dumb little me, like, yeah, I'll pitch. <laughs> Never pitched before in my life. Um, so he just throws me the ball and says, like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it turns out I was said I was accurate. Like I could throw strikes, but it was actually a rainbow because my pitches were so slow. Well, it turned <laughs> out nobody was used to, that terrible of pitching and they couldn't hit me like it was like slow pitch softball coming in there but it was strikes and i mean guys would sit there and they're they're getting ready to like 
swing and the ball's not there. Like, it was hilarious watching these guys. Like, one dude, like, tried to hit it out so hard <laughs> that he missed and, like, spun around and fell down. Like, turns out I'm an amazing pitcher. Glory days. So, How long yeah. did your pitching career and, last for? Was it just one game or they give you another shot? No, no I ended <laughs> up being, like, the starting pitcher for the rest of the season. <laughs> <laughs> like other teams started like copying me like putting in some kid that like just was so slow pitching because actually like with it being so slow it didn't have that you know the faster the pitch the harder you can hit it so yeah you actually couldn't get any speed off the ball because it was such a slow like basically batting practice so all we had to do was just field it <laughs> It turned out pretty good. We actually won a few games after that. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's amazing. So and then I quit. Then you quit. Yeah. Yeah. Cut career cut short. I mean, you could have been you could have yeah. reinvented the game. I think I did. Still feel like there's a mark left on that. Did any team ever figure out field? your timing? Like did it I mean there has to be some team roll along and be like, Don't worry, we got oh, this. Yeah. No, they could hit it, but it would mostly just be pop-ups in the outfield because everybody's <laughs> thinking, oh, I can just knock it out easy. But it just didn't have enough gas on it. It would just be a high-flying pop-up, and that was it. You play any other good. sports growing up? No. Just fishing? Oh, just fishing. So what, what was the I was too moment? tiny for football. I mean, yeah, and too pretty, too. Yeah, can't injure this beautiful face. <laughs> I was I was five foot two, like my tenth grade year. Wow, in high school. I was tiny. I was so cute. <laughs> I bet you didn't think that at the time. My wife did. Oh wow, <laughs> wow. Yeah, so. she's into the short guys. You're not. How tall are you now? Apparently. You're not that short, are you? Like, I'm like. Six, five, eleven, six foot. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So you had a growth spurt. Oh yeah, from tenth to eleventh, <laughs> I went from five two to what I am now. <laughs> wow, I was that kid in summer that was like, oh okay, yeah. So you're gonna win the classic. Yep. Never been there, but like really never been there before. Oh yeah, never. You didn't go pre practice. Uh, never or even nothing. seen. I was planning to, and then, yeah, didn't didn't get everything in in time for okay. the boat. So, yeah, missed what it is, by like three days. <laughs> what is the week before the classic like for you? Like, is it? Are you nervous? Are you excited? Are you I'm chill? So excited. Yeah, I'm just this whole week. I've been. Pretty much, I've been going to the lake every day skipping dogs with the jig. <laughs> I'm just getting dialed in on skipping dogs. Like, feel like that's something that's going to play, and obviously just getting the boat ready and stuff. But I'm just doing my comfort zone type of fishing. That's my favorite thing about the classic. Is like you said, you don't have to worry about it. So I'm going to go do exactly how I want to fish and. You know, try to figure out that bite and just swing for it. What does it feel like right before you pull into the arena? Oh, God. When you're Terrible. sitting there. Awesome. Yeah. It's amazing. When it's like they pull that truck up and whatever the screen, the whatever, I think we had like a little screen that would close or something. Doors yeah. would close. And it's like pitch black there's nobody around right there which is pretty wild and then they you start hearing your music and then you hear your name yeah you get case bumps so bad it, it's i like that feeling yeah it's a it's a cool moment too because you guys talk to so many people between you know what i mean like on the way up yeah. you know like there's a lot of media and different people you're mm -hmm. talking to on the and then you actually get a moment where it's just you and nobody's really talking to you. And, uh, and then you get to come out yeah. and, uh, and I yell stuff in your face. 
it's like 30 seconds of just like everything just kind of stands still and you're just like oh my god and then when as soon as they open the doors though and you see that crowd and everybody's just going nuts god dang that's magical that was that kid up there that was a stupid little kid with little grin on my face just screaming for a t-shirt and then yeah to be on the stage it still don't seem real it's so awesome so you you attended classics before you fished in them yeah how many classics were you at and what 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 one do you remember the most was it the ellis Mm. one no the one i think uh well, <laughs> definitely remember that one. But so Dalton Bobo, he's like the hometown dude yeah. from Tuscaloosa. I mean, he literally lives like half a mile away from me when he got second that year to Dion Hibden at Logan Martin. That the Bobo that one stuck. With, yes, to lose him by one ounce. Oh my gosh, that was yeah. And we had like what was it Tracy? Um, Tracy Bird was like opening, yeah, for that classic singing the watermelon crawl. <laughs> that was awesome. That was such a good classic. You you I like the watermelon crawl? Did. What? Drink, don't drive. Do the watermelon crawl. You don't Why even you... know that song, do you? No, no, I've heard it. I've heard it. I mean, I hang around with a lot of rednecks, so I've definitely. <laughs> heard it. <laughs> I mean, I I got no problem with the watermelon crawl. I mean, what are you coming into in the classic watermelon crawl? Please tell me. Oh, I I wish. Can't say uh, the name of the song. I don't think. You you can't say the name. Is it a surprise? Is it a good song, or are you regretting the song now? Uh, no, it's it's a great like pump up song, but can't say the name, Dave. Leave it to that. The oh, wow. name of it. I can't, I, can't, I can't wait to hear what song this is. You you can't or you won't say the me, name. I can't. No. If okay. I, I mean, do you want me to get canceled? No, no, I do not. I mean, okay. what would what would the fishing world do without you? You I mean, you are exactly precisely. <laughs> We haven't covered a lot. We got, haven't covered a lot of fishing stuff here. Your parents want you Isn't to. Isn't that the best podcast? Well, it's kind of just this podcast, dude. Like, I mean, there's a lot of podcasts where they're going to talk about how many strands of skirt you like on a spinner bait. Not this show. Not this show. Yeah. We just talk about whatever. Your parents really want you to win. I mean, they they. It was really cool to see see how you you know what i mean legit excited they were and how nervous it's something you don't get to see and sometimes i say to all the families i think they really have the hard job i mean you're out there fishing catching 11 sevens i mean you i mean even if you were just fun fishing that's awesome but they got the nerve-wracking job of watching it all go down why do you want to win are you gonna set me up like that are you trying to make me cry Dude. <laughs> oh my gosh. It yeah, it would mean everything. I mean, this is the amount of hard work and like amount of time that I put into chasing this and amount of crap I put my family through, you know, not not being around. That that's that's hard. And feel like, you know, winning the classic, yeah, it's I want to hold that trophy because it's always been my childhood dream, but also I want it for, for them. I mean, they've sacrificed just as much, if not more, you know, for me being able to do this than anybody. It, it would mean the world to them. There's no doubt. My dad would, he's probably already got the nervous poops. What, Sorry. What? Just throw that in there. He gets nervous really bad. He, <laughs> Has nope. to go to the bathroom a lot. <laughs> he gets the nervous poops. He, yeah, he gets the nervous poops really bad. Um, sorry, Dad. I hate to throw you under the bus like that. 
<laughs> I mean, I just talked about how your parents supported you uh, and, and how, yeah. you know, they didn't, they, they do they didn't give They're me a awesome. patch slop or bobblehead like his parents did right back there. <laughs> but they, and now you've just outed your dad's. I mean, so, so literally you he want, you want a problems. championship Sunday. You want your dad in the toilet. Hey, yes. If he's in the toilet, that means there's a chance. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Has this been your whole life? Shot at this thing, whole life. It didn't matter if we were like <laughs> fishing, <laughs> just like a local club tournament. It's like before blast off. He's like, hold on, take take me back real quick. <laughs> he can't handle it. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> I love them, but they are they're so supportive of me. I mean, they would do anything for me. I, yeah, I want this for them. Too. maybe my dad can relax after i win yeah yeah well not. if you do i won't be shaking <laughs> his hand on stage that's for sure yeah you will he's gonna <laughs> give you a hug <laughs> ironically earlier in this podcast you said maybe i want to be the shit and now you make your dad that <laughs> there's gonna be so many poop jokes in this oh have you visualized that moment like, have you literally thought about what Pooping? it would feel like to hoist? No, no, you that too. <laughs> have you visualized lifting that trophy? Yes, a lot. Really? I mean, yeah. I'm, you, Brandon's such like Paul and I, his mentality is is probably the best ever, and I feel like that's why he's been so successful. He's he has got the mentality of a champion. I freaking love it. But that's why I really, really grew up. That was that was one of the guys that I listened to everything that they said. Like he he knows so much about like the mental side of fishing. I mean, he's pretty dang good on the technical, whatever <laughs> lures. <laughs> but his mental game is what makes him so amazing. So, and he's always talked about, you know, visualizing it and all this stuff. And like Rick Clun meditating on the front of the boat, visualizing winning. And I think there's something to that. So, yeah, I've, I've hoisted, I've hoisted a bunch of classic trophies. It's never really touched one. <laughs> no. And will you touch one? Would you touch one or are you like superstitious that way? Oh. Yeah. I won't touch a blue trophy either. Like I'm over at Patrick's house and he's like, these things are heavy. I was like, I believe you. Wow. Not gonna, <laughs> you don't know yeah. the trials and tribulations. <laughs> well, I'm so sorry. You got to pick them up. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> I mean, he's a bunch. It, when you look at his stats, I've said it on live. So it's like, it's fake. you're like, there's a, there's a problem here. He's only been here for five years. How is he? Got this. I mean, he's got three century belt, like four wins. It's stupid what he's accomplished. He's he's done enough, yeah. right? It's time for you to finally hoist that trophy. Yes, hundred percent. Like, move over, and I, I don't know. Me and him kind of got a good rhythm going now too. I, I'm excited about that. We we've kind of really dialed in on how we're working together. Yeah. I guess, and it's it seems to be working pretty good. I mean, if you look at like our last five or six tournaments, it's been freestyle how important is that now i mean i think it used to be years ago like you heard nobody working together like very few anyways and now it seems like there's very few that are not working with somebody maybe not to the extent of you guys and the johnsons where you literally trust everything they say but it seems like everybody's kind of team it's become kind of a team sport do you do you agree yeah I feel like everybody does that and you definitely have to figure it out. Like it is for us, it's just about breaking down a body of water quicker. Like hundred percent. That's all it is. We're that. I think that time at Toledo was the first time we've actually shared a spot to go fish together. Like we never actually fished the same spots, but that's another kind of deal of us working out of, Hey, I'm fishing this, you're fishing this. So we're not bumping heads because we do fish so similar. 
So, I mean, that's been beneficial just as far as knowing where each other is to not take them, try to catch each other fish. So, but yeah, breaking down a body of water with two guys, like Toledo is how massive? <laughs> Plays it big. And yeah. Yeah, just being able to do it with two guys makes a huge difference. And just having that different, you know, a little bit different look at everything. Um, yeah, I was catching fish in like 50 foot of water at Toledo, like stupid deep. And he's like, you know, burning the banks, you know, throughout most of the practice. It's like, it's not happening here. I'm like, well, they're still out here. So it helps. Let's go back to that visualizing thing. I want moment of total oh, honesty. Yeah. So do you, so when you visualize yourself lifting the trophy, do, do you like, is that just something you do in your head? Are you the kind of dude that's like brushing your teeth, getting ready, getting out of the shower and you're lifting that trophy in the mirror? Be honest. Yeah. I've done it in the mirror several times. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I'm standing there in my underwear, maybe even not that. Wow. Straight up, just going for it. I mean, when the moment comes over you, you just got to go with it. Don't matter what you're wearing, right? I so mean, in the Fox, the um, you know, the Fox Sports deal where we yeah. take the pictures at the beginning of the year, um, yeah. they wanted us to do a clip for, like, do a moving clip and like some guys are doing that or flexing or whatever. Yeah. That was mine. You, you yours was, was the hoist. That trophy. Yeah. Wow. We got to make it happen. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, insert trophy here. I like it. I like your way of thinking. I'm getting a trophy this year. Next week. You said. That sounds great to me. If it can't be you, and let's skip over the obvious answer, and it can't be Patrick, who do you think it will be at this classic? Ooh, that's tough. Because Christy is just like, everybody's picking Christy. But dude, pick, not picking him is stupid. Dude's good. <laughs> I mean, really, everybody's picking him for a reason, but I I would love to see Christy win another one. If I can't, I like Christy. He's such a badass. He really is. He's, he's Clint Eastwood. He really is. Like, he, yeah. And then you talk to him, like, backstage, and he's just, like, he looks so intimidating. But when you start talking to him, he's, like, he's so nice and laid back. I think he just looks intimidating to everybody because he's shy. He's yeah. He's just a shy guy. I think he's kind Don't of an intimidating that. character though. Like I think like there's certain people that you no. Know, <laughs> who is intimidating on the elite yeah, series? Is anyone intimidating? Hackney, are you kidding me? Hackney. When Hackney puts them eyes on you, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Has Hackney ever put he's them looking through your soul? really is yeah we made eye contact one time never again that was a bad day <laughs> bad day for him <laughs> wow i like it i didn't know I, i'm just joking love you Agnes. <laughs> have you ever had yeah, i think i think christy's the guy have you ever had any of those kind of run-ins on the elites like battles on the water no you seem to be a i mean you like universally are one of the I mean, you're not Jeff Gustafson. Not going to go that far. I mean, everybody treats him like the Easter Bunny. But, I mean, everybody really <laughs> likes you. Like, I mean, you're a very likable cat. Is that how you've been your whole life? Or is that just a result of being 5'2 in grade 10? No, I think I'm just amazing. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, for real, though, like, I, I fish so weird indifferent i hate i hate a crowd like with a passion i i started to go into that whatever spot in housing that everybody was at and saw those boats just like nope not for me <laughs> so i just go to the dam <laughs> that's why i was by myself like i i i do not like fishing around crowds i like to find dumb fish that 
nobody else is fishing for. I'd rather fish for smaller majority of fish than, you know, the big schools that everybody else is fishing. Will the classic be one with forward facing sonar? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Every tournament. I mean, every it, tournament? it's such a. Yeah. I think every tournament from now on, it, it's going to be used in some way or another. Like, I feel like it's, it's 2D sonar thing that, you know, whether you're sitting there staring at it or not the whole time, you know, that's a different story, but I feel like it's, it's like 2d sonar. We're going to look and see what the depth is. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're going to check the water temperature. You're going to have your pan optics on, you know, just checking out whether or not you're fishing just the bank or whatever. You're going to have it panning around looking either on perspective for structure you know, just going down the bank. Oh, there's a stump out there. It, it's just, it's too good of an efficiency tool to say that we're not going to at least use it in some capacity. Well, we've talked about the classic. We've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about your dad's irritable bowel syndrome. Um, yes. What's your most embarrassing day in the Bassmaster Elite Series? Ooh. Have you had one? Yeah, well, I don't know if it was like publicly known, but I was pretty embarrassed. So last year at last year at the Red River, I, I told people I was about to win that tournament. <laughs> I was on them, Dave. You don't understand. It was magical. Like I, we were staying actually with it was me, Patrick, Cobb, and um, Shane and Clint Davis. We were all staying together. I was like. I'm probably going to win this thing. Like I found the spot and, um, is this in the open? It, it was so perfect. Like what? No. Why we didn't did go to the red, red river, river last year. What? Yeah. I don't know. We didn't. What's the, this yeah. is even embarrassing. This is embarrassing. We, what's what, happening Texas, right here. Sabine river. <laughs> We're in Texas, I've Sabine. tried to block this out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. Sabine. Yeah. That place. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was going to win the hell the red river too, I guess. <laughs> that was one of your no, worst but, finishes so last put, year, wasn't it? I know Dave. You didn't win. That's embarrassing. I did not win. I was, it was my worst finish in my career. So I had one hole up the Natchez river and it was so good. I was throwing a buzz bait. And I mean, these, it was like three to four pounders looked like, just come up waking behind my buzz bait and just blow up. And of course I wasn't setting the hook on them. Like these are big, a three to four pounder. You can't set the hook in practice. And, um, rolled up there in the tournament day. Let me tell you what I smashed some redfish. It was so much fun. <laughs> it was all redfish on a buzz bait. <laughs> I'm a freaking idiot. <laughs> So they weren't bass at all. Patrick, no, they were not bass. It was 100% redfish. <laughs> I'm so stupid. <laughs> I couldn't catch another bass, like, in the whole Neches River. So I, like, run an hour and a half to get to this stupid spot, wait for the tide to get right, and like, which was, like, at 11 o'clock that day. Like, oh, it's going to happen. You just wait, Marshall. I'm going to show you. I'm going to win. <laughs> I get in the tides right and everything's just beautiful. It was this perfect like backwater drain that had hydrilla in it. And whenever the tide get right, there was like one perfect channel running through the middle of it, like five foot deep, hydrilla all over the edge. Throw that buzz bait down through there and it just I mean, they come unglued on it. I'm a dumbass. Redfish on a half shell. I mean you could you can eat i mean <laughs> yeah it was fun i ain't gonna lie i stayed a little bit longer than i should have just because they were biting but it was uh, that was that was embarrassing yeah. patrick and Cobb and all them was like hey what happened did your motor blow up like you're gonna have 20 pounds a day yeah they still laugh at me about that well 
I mean, things happen. People make, I mean, dude, I, I, years ago, fish in a tournament, I'll, I'll, I'll make you feel good about yours. I don't think I've ever told this story publicly. So years ago, fishing a tournament, I'm fishing a row of Botox. And these are like super clear water, but you got to stay back from them, right? But you, a lot of times you'll see like the, the fish, a shadow of the fish or whatever. So I see this giant just sitting there, just like in a freaking postcard, right? And I sit, I'm back and I'm firing stuff at it. And th this thing won't react to anything. And I fished this thing for like 45 minutes. And then all of a sudden I looked up and there was a, you know, those flag that are shaped like fish. <laughs> and they, you know, they, but they, they're like, it was the reflection. It was the shadow of the flag that I was fishing. You're dumber than me. I am. I am. I dumb, that's why I'm a tournament MC. I love that. You're fishing for a, you're fishing a shadow. Uh, the, the, the funny part was Did there was a guy, it? like, <laughs> he never bit. He never bit. I gave up on it, and I didn't even let the dude on the boat know. Like, I was just like, this one's not going to bite. It's just not biting today. <laughs> oh, it was a pro -am, so he was firing his stuff. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if he ever realized what was going on. We moved away quickly. Uh, in an, he wow, was look at that hair. Jacket giant. Why do you wear a hat? I mean, gosh, how come there's a weird, here's a weird thing in the world. How come Alabama has its own hairstyles? Like, what is that called? That's a, it's got like a name, Sexy. doesn't it? What? Sexy. Oh, okay. But like, you don't oh. see anybody in yeah, Kentucky, I don't get that. anybody in Michigan, anybody in Florida, <laughs> California, nobody is that hairstyle. But if you watch. An Alabama game, and they show their they show their fans. I mean, every guy in Alabama has that hairstyle. Is it because that of is you? a good question? Probably, yeah. It really probably is. So everybody called it the Bieber haircut, but he we've been rocking do this it way before that. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't know. That's a. And everybody asked me that, and I still have no clue. But it's like. College kids will come to Alabama and then all of a sudden change their hair because they're here. <laughs> like, I don't know. The girls just must love it here. Clearly, man, it's one thing's proven in history. Men will do a lot of dumb things if a girl says it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> they just say hi. I'll do some really stupid stuff. <laughs> so when you win the Bassmaster Classic, will you make your first podcast appearance right here? Mm. Wow, this is uncomfortable. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm gosh, I'm always I'm... here for you, Dave. Hey, and I'm here for you. Like, <laughs> last time, last time I was on here, but not because you really wanted me on here, but like you somebody did. fell through and all that stuff. You're like, hey, can you come on like in 20 minutes? Yeah. I mean, I I literally just threw the weed eater down like mid yard and took off running. Well, not, it wasn't that I didn't <laughs> want you. It was that you were trash talking me in public. Like, I mean, you're not good at social, but you were like out in social. Like, why haven't I been on this podcast? And oh, yeah. <laughs> remember that part of the whole equation. <laughs> See, that was good. That worked. That was good social media <laughs> that stuff. That did work, didn't it? Yeah. 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 Uh, Start trash talking funny. sponsors you want. Why the hell isn't okay. he giving me those dollars? <laughs> I have tried so hard for Milo's tea. Like, I need some help. Trash Why can I right not now. give my? They suck. I hate Milo's. No, that's not how you trash. You gotta say you love them, and you. I mean, do you... I do love Milo's. That's that was the whole joke. I was drinking Milo's. Is that Milo's <laughs> in there? Yes, that's Milo's. What there. makes Milo's better than others? It tastes better. Great answer. I don't know. It's <laughs> like. Like a little piece of heaven in a bottle. Good. Little piece of heaven in a bottle. I, yeah. I think that was freaking. So look in the camera and say, Milo's, a little piece of heaven in a bottle. Let's give it right now. Milo's, little piece of heaven in a bottle. Roll tight. <laughs> I, th I think it's come. I mean, all other than just holding up a bottle of Milo's there. I mean, their commercial is set. I mean, Bass, future Bassmaster Classic champion. 
2024 Bassmaster Classic champion, Justin Hamner. I'll have the jug on one hand and the trophy on the other. Because they ain't heavy. Wouldn't that be great to roll up to Patrick and be like, these things, now these things are actually really heavy. This thing's really heavy. (laughs) Stuck it. (laughs) Dude, you're Um, awesome. I always enjoy our conversations, and uh, we will have many more in the future. I hope that Milo's money comes flying in. Oh, it just needs to come pouring. Thank you for having me, Dave. Hey. And as always. Sorry, that's your line. What? What? I was. I was. What were you going to say? As always, take it away, Bob. But it, <laughs> no, there's other guests on this show. It's not just you. <laughs> oh, is Klein going to be on here? Yeah. Oh, somebody might actually watch this then. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure some people are going to watch it. There's <laughs> another. Yeah. There's actually, if everything works out, I probably shouldn't. Ah, screw it. I'm laying my balls on the line. There is. This show has two classic champions between them they have won eight titles Jeez. and you you're the cream okay. in the oreo hold up is van damme van damme gonna announce on here you're gonna say something please come back to bath please kevin please i just want to <laughs> fish against you i'm gonna beat kevin van damme all right. Or All just right. let him beat me. I don't care, but please, Kevin, do it. We've appealed Dude. to Milo and Kevin Van Dam. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Screw Milo. I want Kevin back. <laughs> Dude, I mean, we were this close to Milo's. Then you threw out the screw Milo's. Like, well, sorry, sorry. Okay. Edit, edit that. All right. Bobble I'll beat I'll be that. <laughs> the one and only Justin Hamner. It is always Hamner time. Thank That's you, it. Dave. Thank, thank you, Justin. Let's awkwardly end this. Whoa, a little too far. There you have it, Justin Hamner. And I thank him for being on the program. And I got a feeling that we're going to see a lot more of him. Uh, not just on this show, but on Bass Life. He really seems to be coming into his own and... um I think we can have a lot of fun with that dude. So um, we'll be seeing Hamner time again in the future. But one thing that I did promise you guys, and he promised me, and I am so thankful for it, his 50th season of competition, Rick Clunt said, I'll stop by once a month and we'll talk about whatever. This one went in a different direction than I thought it would. But man, this is gold. So it's time. 32-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, 16-time Bassmaster winner, four-time Classic champion, former Bassmaster Angler of the Year, the legendary Mr. Rick Klun. Rick Klun, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, I uh, This last couple of tournaments, I, I was very disappointed. I'm not going to in myself because I'm trying to improve. I'm trying to, I really thought there would be enough going on that I wouldn't have to compete except the way I used to compete my style. But uh, that's where I, I guess my biggest lesson coming out of this event was that it's time to recalibrate, recalibrate in my mind, what's a good string. And not just what's a good string in the tournament, but what's a good string in practice. And that's where I'm messing up badly. I even know it. I even know this is not a good string. You know, I'll say at the end of a practice day, it was a fun day, but this is not a good string. In the old days, for example, in the old days, if you had a 15-pound bag, that was pretty good. Yeah. If you had a 20-pound bag, that was really good. If you had a 25-pound bag, that was great. That's not true anymore. And especially when in practice, a 15 pound bag on most of these good lakes that we're fishing is not any good in a tournament situation. Uh, A 20 pound bag is okay, but it still doesn't even guarantee you you'll be in the top 50. Uh, We saw that at the last tournament big time. And that was, that's that, that lake, lake is an anomaly above all the anomalies we fish. But uh, 
the, so what I've had to do now is I've got to make myself in practice realize, okay, you call it 15 pound bag, but that's not good enough. You got to be at least catching a 20 and more than likely between a 20 and 25 is, is going to be okay. And if you get up around 30, you're doing great. But that that's the, the new measuring stick. Uh, you know, you, it's, 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 it's gone up big time. Uh, it's because like the first day at Lake Fork, I had almost 20 pounds, but that wasn't any good. Okay. So uh, at that type of lake, 20 pounds, is, you're just hanging on by the threads. 25, you're kind of a little bit in the running. 30, you're, you're doing what you need to be doing. So that's one of the major things I have to do. And that takes a lot of discipline, especially in practice, is to, to elevate that bar of what's good in your head and, and push for that. And don't be satisfied with just catching 20 keepers that day, thinking, well, that's good. Uh, and in practice, I didn't really catch, get on any quality fish. Now, I'm determined I did catch two, one or two big ones every day, but that, that's not enough. The one or two big ones anymore used to just throw you. Hey, if I get one big one in a limit, I'm good. None, none in. And I'm talking tournaments, okay? That's what we also have to separate. We have to separate the people we're talking to. Hey, what's good for you depends on if you're a tournament angler. If you're not a tournament angler, then boy, there's a lot of good days out there. Uh, just numbers. It can be 22 pounders, and that's a great day. Let's, I just really, it sounds like we're trying to tell the whole bass fishing world what's good, what's a good day. And I'm not. I'm just saying, if you're fishing at the elite level, this is what your, where your brain has to be. Well, let me ask the question that some may think is obvious. Why? Why is it all changed? Is is it all electronics? Uh, it's not all electronics, but let's use an analogy here. Uh, maybe it's good, maybe it's not. But do you remember when golf was at the stage that fishing was before uh, scoping came in? Everybody was kind of, back in the old days, I only had 10 guys I had to beat out of a 200-man field. Yeah. Okay. And even more important, the fact that there was only 10 I felt like I had to beat, the gap between that 10 and the next huge. That it wasn't close. Now, uh, you have to beat the whole field. Everyone. And what little tiny gap is there is not very big anyway from the best in doing it and the few that are still trying to move up. And uh, when golf came along and golf was kind of that way until Tiger Woods showed up. And all of a sudden, <laughs> here's where everybody's at, you know. And then all of a sudden Tiger Woods shows up and here's Tiger and here's the rest of the group. And that, in bass fishing, that was kind of true before scoping. You know, it was like this. Then when scoping came in, boom, here's that group that's scoping, and here's the group that's down here. They're, they've fallen way behind. And uh, it's they want to blame it on scoping, but they, it's the blame's on them because it's not a hard thing to do. What they're doing is not hard to do. I told you the last time here. You've got about a two-year hard investment, and you can be awful good at this. But if you just want to sit there and ignore it and play like it's not fair, then, yeah, you're going to be that group way down here and stay down here. But here's the difference between Tiger Woods and fishing. Tiger Woods was about the only one up here. Right now, there's a 20 or 30 or 40 of these young kids that have made that jump, that quantum leap ahead of everybody else. So... And you, it's your choice. How, how do you want? How do you want to address it? Uh, I feel I'm sad. I feel sad for a lot of the anglers that think the answer is is banning it, because if you ban it, if you succeed, which you're not going to, not not to the degree they would like, if you succeed in banning it, you will never be able to say you're the best angler. That's over. You will never be able to say that, because the best angler now. It won't even be a scoper. It will be a combination of a guy that can do both. And that's what I, I, I wish I have. I don't know how many more years I have, but I'd like to prove, prove that myself by you know, getting where I'm fishing at the high level scoping. And everybody knows my credentials, historically speaking, fishing the other way. 
that's going to be the best thing in the future. And if if you do away with scoping and it doesn't exist, nobody will ever say the best anglers are here. So, hey, fine, ban it, but you're just fishing for your buddies. And and, and I understand it's a fine, more a financial situation for a lot of these guys. I mean, their paychecks have been taken out of their hand. I understand that part. But that's the game you chose. You chose to fish against the best. And now we have another another definition of what's best. So what about the people that will come back at what you said? You never be the best. What about the people that say, well, if you're really the best, you don't need scoping? What is your answer to that? That's like you, you, if you if you have a playbook that makes you win the Super Bowl, it's like saying, I don't need the playbook. You're not you're not gonna win it if you if you don't have a playbook and if you don't have the most of or if you're not using the most advanced methods of doing it. Uh I mean you've seen that in NFL. You had the you had the old school and then a uh, Tom Brady, and then you have the Patrick Mahomes school that now, you know, coaches like Andy Reid are willing to uh now adjust the new way of playing to those players. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, it's – so uh, to me, all sports are all will constantly if, – if they're true sports, they're constantly going to rise in excellence. And uh, so I don't – I mean – and I, here's the other thing that frustrates me is – we're so ignoring in the last three or four events of this year, counting some of the other organizations' tournaments that were on Toledo Bend, Rayburn, ours on Toledo, then ours on Lakeport. I've learned more in those three events than I have learned in my whole career about bass behavior. Absolutely wow. more. So we're just saying get that that information, that knowledge is not is not valid. Let's just throw it out and say that's not true. No, that's wrong. That's totally wrong. So seek another level. There's other tournaments right now starting with scoping, with no scoping. Fish those. And that's the good thing about term about bass fishing. There is so many levels you can choose. You don't have to play the game with that. But the, you're. But I'm, this is my opinion. You can forget being the best if you if you can't do it both ways. And I'm talking about the scopers too. I'm saying, hey, if that's the only yeah. way you can do it, you can't be the best either. You got to be able to do it both ways. How are you able to be so different? I mean, people want to paint this whole thing as the younger guys versus the older guys. Well, you are the most senior angler on tour. And how are you able to see it different than so many others? I think Zona said it's because I'm weird. <laughs> And then a lot of people will agree with that. But I guess one of my, there's a lot of things growing old, but one of the things that disappoints me and saddens me as much as anything is how so many of the old anglers that I know become crybabies. I mean, literally crybabies. And, and they don't celebrate this path they've been on of doing the thing they most love to do for 15, 20, 25 years. They start to complain about it. I don't get it. I just don't get it. I, uh, gosh, we've been so lucky to be able to do what we do. And it, yeah, it's not always financially rewarding. But golly, there's so much more to it than that. And and then they forget that. I, I, that's one of the things I say, even when they say, what's the best thing you can tell a young angler? Is I know capitalism demands that you you put a roof over your head, you put food on the table, you know, uh, and all those things. But how big a roof do you need? How, how much food do you need when you're doing what you love to do? I don't, you don't need as much. You're doing what you love to do. That's the most important thing and this thing that's so rare in our society that so few people, 
I see it in my own children, how they look at what I do and they try to figure out how can they be that way. And, and they may, maybe, they, maybe they can't be that way. They've got to find their own path and, and their own. And I would, that's why, again, we're just so, so fortunate that we are lived, my life fell in a time frame that allowed me to do something that didn't exist until I was 24, 25 years old. And, and now still exists. Nobody knew how long it was going to exist. So if you got to do it 10 years and you got to do it 15, don't don't turn in. Don't forget how well, how lucky you were. It's a great way to live life. I gotta I gotta ask you this because I, I know we're gonna hear about it in the comments and 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 Rick boy, you 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 got you figured out this podcasting thing. You're going to get some reaction from some people from some of the stuff you said, but you are known as this great instinctual angler. You know what I mean? If you want, if you want to learn about the owl, study the mouse, all of these famous things that have floated around about you, the, the master, Mr. Miyagi of the sport. What do you say to people that say that, it, that scoping has taken the natural instinct of an angler out of the sport. I think that's, that's, I'd have to really think about that in, in its full context. I, I don't think that's not true necessarily. That could be true. But, uh, but the thing that does that more than anything else is, is, is worrying about if I'm going to make a check. Yeah. That's always been there. And it's a legitimate worry. I'm not saying it's not. But that, that steals that quicker than anything, that, that natural connection that you have. And, and, the, and, of course, that's one of the biggest things I promote about fishing. It's the last remaining vehicle for the masses to stay connected. And that's what's so great about all the high school kids and the college kids now have this vehicle. If you try to take that... If I try to take a college kid or a high school kid and out there and I'll, hey, here, you need to appreciate nature. You need to blah, blah, you know, get, get real, philosoph real philosophical with him. It ain't going to work. Nine, 99 kids out of 100. But if I just put him in nature and let nature do it over time, nature will, will make him see the value of, of it. And then when he sees the value, of it, he'll become one of his best protectors. So, um, yeah, no, that's a possibility, but it's also a possibility that it will expand our understanding. I mean, if your understanding is wrong about the bass and its behavior, then then you're then you're basically saying the Earth is still flat. And when it, if that's not true, are you really connected to the true the truth of what nature is? No, this technique, like I said, I learned more in four events this year than I learned my whole career about bass behavior. It was amazing to watch it. It was absolutely amazing. And you you did it, you all saw it. You know, they started way out in Main Lake and then they slowly moved to the mouth of the creeks and then they slowly moved back into the creeks. And finally at Lake, at Lake Fork, they were actually some of them in the very far backs of the creeks and the fish were still in the middle, sunning, waiting to move up and they were just starting to move up. But it was a perfect map of that. What we've always understood to some degree, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, the exactness of what I, what I visualized Golly, it was it was just amazing to me to watch. It was almost like now my eyes were seeing underwater the exact movement of the fish. And um, you know, Jacques Cristeau, he wanted to go underwater to get a, <laughs> a better view of what was really there. And the scope gives us that opportunity, whether you like it or not. Uh, and the fact that it obsoletes you as an angler, which it does, because uh, I know that. You know, if you brought me or Kevin Van Dam in, Kevin would probably learn scoping. I might not. I wouldn't have had my career. Like if my career, the way I used to fish, and now again, the way I used to fish still worked excellent, but not at the high level of tournaments. So keep that separate when I say it obsoleted me. It obsoleted me at, at the elite level. It obsoleted Kevin's style at that elite level. 
I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I apologize, Kevin, for speaking for you, and I'm sure you would disagree, but maybe, maybe not. I think he, he's smart enough. But Kevin's one of those that if he stayed in it, he would, he would, he would be doing it. He wouldn't, especially with his talent with a jerk bait. You know, and the jerk yeah. bait is just a key bait there. Yeah, I think he hit, he dislikes scoping just for the simple fact that more people throw jerk baits now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I understand that. <laughs> because I feel like I was one of the very first to bring jerk baits alive. I mean, my 32 pound string at Kentucky Lake, four of them smallmouth were all on a, a long A bomber that we had to put weight on. There's a friend of mine from Arkansas, Tim Wilson, said, Hey, Rick, the guys up here in Arkansas and the Ozarks are putting weight on their jerk baits. And so we started putting weight on ours because there was no suspended jerk baits. And I, in that Kentucky Lake tournament that first day, the, the, the suspended jerk bait, you know, was introduced to the world of fishing, and uh, and, and after then, all we see pretty much is suspended jerk baits. But so did everybody else started learning that's a dang good bait for big fish. I think when people compare different careers, and it doesn't have to be fishing; it has to be any sport. It's such an unfair comparison. You know, I'm always going to think that Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player. My son probably. Is going to think LeBron or something, you know what I mean? Whoever, sure. but you always rely on your generation as, as those were the best, but I don't think it's, it's, it's a fair comparison anyways. You know what I mean? Like the, you, you can hear a quarterback say, well, if I played under the current rules, I would have done this much more. Right. If Kevin Van Dam, just as simple as if his whole career and yours, there was spot lock involved. How many more events did you would you have won? You know, I, I mean, and it's every single innovation that comes. So it's it's tough to compare generations to other generations. It's it's, it's you you can't. The only way you could do that if you had a time machine, and you pulled Kevin in his best ten years, and me in my best ten, and Roland in his best ten, and then put us all in the same time frame, and then maybe you might get a a better picture of that. But no, no, you absolutely, you're right. If we if we had a time machine, we don't have the budget for it. But if we had a time machine, <laughs> what 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 year would we go to, Rick? Uh, see, probably two thousand. No, yeah, two thousand and forty-four. <laughs> Why two thousand and forty-four? Because I want to know what that's like. I know what the others are like. I mean, I don't, you know, and I, for everything that we say that this bad happen, bad happening, gosh, there's some incredible things happening. Yeah. And I don't, I just hate to miss them. <laughs> you know? I, I really don't. Uh, you know, they just send a new satellite into space that I mean that, that I forget the name of it. The old one I think was Hubble, but this one's a new one. But it's going to do show us so much more. Again, it's going to show us what scoping is showing fishermen. It's going to show us a universe that we've been guessing at, and some of our guesses might have been right, but a lot of them probably aren't. And so, I just don't want to. I, I'd like to have the answers, you know. Um, that that I don't have, but um, so I know that wasn't what you want for wanting. But I'm not one of those that believe make everything great again. I, that that's that's boy, that's such a phony statement to begin with. Because just like you're pointing out, when were when was everything great again? The Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the World War One, the Great Depression, World War Two, on and on. which one? And everybody, there's a probably a little time frame in there that what you were asking me that, yeah, I would like, but it's kind of different for all of us. So if, we, if we're trying to make it great again, boy, that's going to be a mixed bag of stuff. And, then, and not everybody's going to like it. Uh, whether it's Zona's analogy of you being a weirdo, which which I love, you're a wonderful weirdo if you are a weirdo. Um, I, I think you just proved it again, because I think most people's human nature is to go back rather than to go forward. I mean, to go back to 
when we were younger, when and whatever, and that's different for everybody. For some people, it might be they want to go back to high school, they want to go back to the thirties, whatever. Do you do you believe that most people? I mean, if I asked most people your age, do you think many of them would say forward? No, no, I, I, I doubt because that they would they would be they would be true to the intent of your question. <laughs> I just um, I'm not always true to the intent of a question. No, and just so you know, I honestly had no intent. Like well, people think you ask questions and you're expecting. I try to ask you questions that that I don't know the answer to. That I and that's what I enjoy about our conversations because you always bring it in a different direction than than a lot of times is the obvious. But let's talk about let's get away from the F word. Let's let's talk <laughs> about um you kicked off your 50th season, Toledo Ben, that morning to to idle out. Did that feel any different that morning? Or was it just another tournament? No, it was somewhat different because you know, my wife is really in, in the people around me, you and others, and a lot of others are, are forcing me in a good way. And when I say forcing, that's sometimes interpreted as a negative, but they're forcing me to reflect, which I've never done up, up until just recently coming into this year. And it, we're, we're more like if you're a running back in football and they hand you the ball and you see the hole and you burst through the hole and you see the goal line and you're running as fast as you can for the goal line. Did you see the great blocks that were made to make that hole? No. The only way you get to see those blocks is if you go back and look at the film. And that's when you reflect, wow. Boy, he, he man, I love that guy. I love that center. I love that tackle, you know. And uh, even guy, when you break through the hole and you bust your butt on the other side, you appreciate it. Man, what a player. He shouldn't have been able to make that tackle, but he dodged that block. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm looking at things of my past, and I'm getting to see more of it than I've ever seen. So it is different. How has the reaction of other anglers been around you going into this season? Oh. Um, Appreciate. I'm. I'm. I appreciate it. Um, it's in the. It's a strange community now to me because I'm not around the ones I was around most of my career. So it's all young anglers. And and to be honest, I I think ninety percent of them are sincere. But you know, you're always wondering. My dad always told me. He said when I got to be quote successful, he said, you know, Rick, success breeds resentment. And uh, he said, and especially, he thought he had it, especially close to home. So, you know, you know, in some cases that, uh, and that's what's going on a little bit with the F word. Uh, it's, it's, it's so successful at breeding tremendous resentment. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of when I was winning and I was winning a lot. And one of the anglers, uh, competitors' wives walked up to me and I probably told you this, but, and she said, don't you realize it's somebody else's time to win? And I at first thought she was joking. Then I looked at her eyes and I said, she ain't joking. And then all I could say was, I didn't know I was supposed to take turns, you know? And uh, so, but th th these are all young anglers that are mostly, you know, there's been a few of uh, the ones that have been around for a while and I, and I really can, uh, I can't, I can, I can feel their sincerity. Uh, and there's always a few that, that are forcing it out of politeness, you know, uh, that's okay. I, I mean, I, I'm in this, but I guess the thing that does, the young anglers are the ones that intrigue me more right now, because that's who I'm mostly around are the young ones. And there's some that I've never even fished against. I think one of them, his name was Kyle 
Kyle Patrick, the first day of us taking off, got out of his boat, walked over, and, and he just was very kind, very kind. And this, you know, kid wasn't even born, you know, 25, you know, 25 years of my career. So that's really, that does touch me, that, 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 that he has taken the time to do that. Patrick Walker's, I'll never forget, you know, when I won in 2016. Yeah. Oh, was it 16? 19, I think. 19. Yeah. But yeah, it was 19. And he had a big bag, and he, he handed it to you or Trip, and he walked straight to me, didn't even look at the scales, and congratulated me and shook my hand. And it, it was one of the most sincere things I've ever seen, I've had somebody do. So there are moments to that. Uh, again, I don't think we all, we, me, has the mental capacity to appreciate it completely. We saw the youngest, I mean, speaking of youth, we saw the youngest Elite Series champion ever. And I mean this out of respect, but you are the oldest Elite Series champion ever. Which is harder, or can that even be judged? And that can be judged. Um, the I don't think it can be judged, but uh, I don't think it needs to be. Uh, that's the beauty of this thing we do called fishing. Whether you're six or six, 60, there's a place for you to be if you want to be there. And uh, I, I also, along those same lines, I was looking at the classic contenders. And we have a classic, young classic contender this year that's still in high school. You know that? Yeah. I'm sure you do. You've got a great <laughs> mind. That's amazing. It's, it's amazing. He's in high school. I love it. I, I do. I uh and then you know, I know I know Kevin is uh, is fishing in one of his last major events coming up in a week, I think. And uh, I saw some comments about they're rooting. <laughs> he may not like it, but he he they're rooting for Kevin. He's 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 kind of the nostalgic favorite, like Rick Klein, you know. So, but at least you know. So, at the beginning, that's a, that's neat. There's. And we and here's the neat thing: social media is 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 a double edged sword. But we that that is the one comparison that the, that the young can't forget. Michael Michael Jordan. They can't forget Roland Martin. He's available now on social media. Who he was and what he did. And again, I've gotten so many compliments from father and sons come up to me at the tournament lands and said, man, I, we learned so much and gained so much appreciation by watching the bass, you know, cast show yeah. that, that you had. Because they basically that was the history of Rick Lund and you got you got to uh, real quick. And so I don't I, that that's again we live in a time that allows us to uh, appreciate some of those older people better than we could appreciate Jim Thorpe or or Babe Ruth, those before then. <laughs> so. How was it watching that for you? You know, sitting down and actually watching it. That's when it first hit me that uh, um, that I'm watching game film. I'm watching my game film that I've never watched. I have never watched myself. I could see the whole play, not just the part, the role I played in it. I could see the other players. I gained appreciation for the other players more than they even had before. And the importance that they played in who I became, we're all products of those that come before us. And, and in a lot of ways, we don't even know all the pieces and where they came from. But I was a product of, you know, obviously Ray. I was a product of Bob Cobb. Bob Cobb, I was a product of Bill Dance, I was a product. Without them, I couldn't have formed into the person I am. Uh, and it, so it allowed me to really, which I didn't have enough appreciation for all those people, to be honest, uh, because I was caught up in some of the negativity of, of that time frame too, because it wasn't all positive. It, there was a lot of negativity. Uh, so, it's uh, that was a great series for me. What is it about this sport? 
and, and or maybe it's every sport, but I just feel like that, that there's always going to be that, you know, for something that everybody, I mean, it, what makes pro angler special in my opinion is that you all got into it. And the goal was just to be able to fish for a living. That that was, you know, it wasn't to be rich, but it feels like to me, like I look at the first two events and I'm like, we have nothing but upper, we should be high-fiving. I mean, incredible crowds, bigger crowds than, than we've seen in both those venues, maybe ever, or at least in a very, very long time, the excitement around some of these stuff. But it seems like the fishing industry always wants to cling to what they perceive as negative. And I don't even mean at the top level. I, I mean, you take a tournament angler and they, they look at a sheet of paper that's advertising a tournament on that body of water. And as they look at it, they start, they start to see where there's holes like that. Well, what's how many boats have entered? What they can't guarantee that this is that. Like, do you think every sport is like that? And we just see this or, or do you think it's different? I think at some stage of it, every sport was like that. Now, now all we see is the is is the billion dollar contracts. We don't yeah. we didn't see the early stage. Uh, so, I don't think we see the whole the whole the whole sport like fishing kind of has been laid out here uh, lately, and. Um, and if I had a magic wand, that's the one thing I would do. I would I would tap each young angler that's entering the sport and and put a spell on him that he will never forget. No, he would never allow anything to forget his love and passion for why he's doing this. And I would just say, just be satisfied with food on the table and a roof over your head. Don't get caught up with this BS about becoming rich. Because you're in the wrong sport if you did that. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm, Mark Twain said the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Well, a lot of these guys are going to say, well, yeah, you got it made. That's why you can say blah, 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 all these this. No, the reports of my wealth have been greatly exaggerated. So you, you there, there's, there's, there's a few anglers uh, that are, are a heck of a lot better businessmen than me. But I never, I still to this day, I live where I want to live. Yes, I'm fortunate. And I live in the house I want to live in. I live with people I want to live with. And uh, But I've never, even when my dad and mom went bankrupt, I, I, don't, I don't ever remember missing a meal. I don't ever remember not having a roof over my head. They, they still put those basic things around me even in the worst of times. And I've had financially the worst of times. You know that story. But I was never more happy than I was in my whole life. So that's why I would just try to instill in these anglers that, that when before you get into it, you know, ask yourself the question, what do you want most? Uh, and if you want to get rich, you might ought to think about doing something else. If you just want to do something you love to do, have food on your table and a roof over your head, hey, just put your heart in it and, and you can do it. I want to touch on the youth anglers because that's been kind of a pattern through this conversation. Do you think that that's kind of just a natural, obviously electronics has helped that, but that being said, do you not think that's the natural, the youth, the influx of youth anglers where most people in the past started mid twenties, maybe thirties, but does that not just show how the sport is growing and evolving? Like when you see young, I mean, I remember years ago, and I keep using this analogy, but I remember years ago, Steve Larmer, who played in the NHL, played for the Rangers, you know, the Blackhawks. He had a, won a Stanley Cup, had a great career. And I remember him turning to me and being like, these rookies, it's ridiculous what's happening in our sport. We used to show up to training camp to get in shape. And now these kids are working out all year long and they show up and they're, you know, it, he was half joking about it, but that was to me an evolution of the sport. And I, and I think in some ways we're seeing that right now. Would you agree? Most definitely. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm not going to tell names here, but because I, I really like these guys, but 
when I got into the sport, I was one of those young guys, even though I wasn't young compared to these young guys. I didn't get in sport until I was in my late twenties, but I was relatively young to compare to the field. And but then at the practice or after the first day of the tournament, I'd see these guys out drinking and partying. They can then I knew you can beat me one day, but you're not going to beat me two and three or four days because you ain't going to survive what your 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 bad habits. And these are friends, so I, I but and then but now when I observe that these young anglers coming in, I don't I'm not saying we all have bad habits, but they, they don't show they don't show any bad habits when they're at an event. They do their homework. They do they 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 work as hard as you can possibly work. Uh, I mean, I I can't beat them to the ramp anymore. You know they're going to beat me to the ramp, and I certainly can't beat them off the lake. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I can beat them off the lake because they they they'll be out there until the rules say you can't be out there anymore, which is thirty minutes after sunset. And uh, that part I really admire in them because that's what it takes to move. And that's the other thing is, and obviously when they're doing their homework, they're they're looking at the best way to achieve their goals. And Cody Huff showed the at at, at Toledo Bend. If you go back and watch that tournament, I think it was a Toyota Series event on Toledo Bend that he won and where he won it at, almost every one of the good guys said, we knew there was fishery there, but we never fished out where, they, where he was fishing. And he and from that point on, he basically told the young anglers, there's, there's, there's virgin water that was not being fished. And if you wanted to, to get there quickly, that's the water you need to be fishing. And and they did. And again, you know, it's uh and again it that 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 the use of that in that electronics is 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 expanding. I thought at first it's only gonna be helpful in deep water. No, it's helpful anywhere you want to use it. So um, again, I uh, I just hope I have time to uh show some skill doing that. Uh, you know, I did everything I could this winter. I got brand new eyes and brand new screens to look at. And so if, if I can't do it, then it's not my equipment's fault, it's mine. With anglers adapting to it, is it a question of not being able to do it or not being able to, I mean, you have 50 years of successful knowledge in your head. Mm -hmm. When I'm watching the events now, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the young guys, it's easier because a lot of their success has come with that technology in their life. I mean, it's, I remember <clears throat> my first GPS. I didn't trust it for a little while. I, I still read a map, but it, it feels like they almost trust it more and they're able to block out the, well, the allure to... to go shallow or the allure to chase yeah other things that have been successful in the past. You're right. You have to, you have to be willing to abandon what has made you successful your whole career. And that's the hardest part. I, I totally admit it. Um, you have to be able to abandon that. But then here's the thing. You, you put all that equipment on your boat. The one thing you don't abandon is the work ethics you had with the old technique. You have to now move to the new technique. You know, when you when you practice all day for and you had three quality bites, but you were doing six different things, and now you know you have to translate that one thing that produced the quality bites into the key thing. And then you got to put your work ethic to it because that means you may be, is, I like the D. Thomas approach of flipping. I don't, I'm not out there to get Rick Clunes 20, 25 bites a day. I'm out there to get five or six, but I know they're going to be the right fish. You have to have that same ethics with this because I can't tell you how many times I've heard Cody Huff say, yeah, I caught two eight pounders today, but I only saw six fish all day. Only saw six fish. That's the same. So is that good? Is that the D. Thomas uh, flipping mentality that you need? Yes, you need to have that same attitude. What what is a good number of bites for that technique? You, a lot of people think go out there and you see a school of two hundred fish. 
I, I rarely talk to one of these young anglers that admits to that. That it's not, these big fish are, are not in these schools of two pounders chasing threadfin chat. You know, so, so it's a work that they, they also admire that they are applying to this technique that, yeah, if you just, if you, all you do is put the electronics on your boat and you don't apply that work ethic, it, it's probably a waste of money. There's no magic pill. There's no magic shot. But um, every single time I talk to you, Rick, is magic. And I, and I, honestly, I, we started before we recorded this, you know, we were like, yeah, we're not going to talk about four face and sonar, but it is a topic that needs to be talked about. And I thank you, regardless of where you sit on the debate, because boy, people are polarized over it. It's awesome to hear. I mean, when I hear you say, I learned more in four events than I have the 50 years of my career. I mean, that's got to stop people in their tracks. Well, there, I, I mean, I, you know, one of my best friends is one of the greatest uh, opponents of it. And that's okay. It's okay. But the only thing I will continue to bring out is do it the way you want to do it. Yeah. And let others do it the way they want to do it. Okay. And be happy. Don't be unhappy just because they're not doing it your way and vice versa. Wise words as always, the wonderful Mr. Rick Clun. There you have it, the one and only Rick Clun. And it is always an adventure with him. I mean, it, it blows me away how you ask him a question, you expect it to go one direction, it always goes the opposite direction. And here's another thing that blows me away, how we're pulling this show off. A big announcement coming out today with the one and only Kevin Van Dam. And um, I'm going to try not to screw this up, but we're going to be highly technical. And I'm going to give him a call right now and hear it right from his mouth. Bear with me. Here we go. Here we go. Hey, Dave. KVD, big day. It is a big day. You have the entire fishing industry a buzz. What is the big news? Well, I am, you know, launching a TV show. So you've kind of I've kind of told you about it a little bit in the in the past, but all the plans are finally all complete and everything is uh, is up and going and you know, at the beginning of 2025, the first quarter, you will see the Van Dam experience with the, with myself on it uh, on the Outdoor Channel. I like it, the Van Van Dam experience. What style of show is it going to be, Kevin? Well, it's kind of um, a blend. You know, we've we thought a lot about different ideas to you know to do, but I mean, I got to be me for for. First and foremost, you know, I I love to fish, you know, kind of my way. And, um, you know, I've got a lot of history doing that in tournaments for a lot of years. So you're going to see that. And and I like, you know, I want people to learn, you know, stuff. And I'm going to travel around the country and visit a lot of these iconic fisheries that, that we've been to, you know, in the past. And, you know, obviously I think i got a good perspective because of the then and then you know, how you actually go about it now. So, so we'll have some nostalgia and some history um, mixed in with it, but also some information. And then, uh, and then I've got a lot of, you know, I'm going to have a lot of cool guests on as well too. You know, I, I know, um, you know, a lot of people that are unique to that love to love to fish that come from other venues and uh, you know, other realms. And uh, I'm going to, you know, have some, some pretty cool guests at times on my show as well for it. So it should be a lot of fun. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the main thing is make it, uh, make it interesting and, uh, exciting and, you know, and get something out of it as well too. So I'm excited to see it, but I got to ask you, you've done so many shows for, you know, whether it be strike King Bass Pro, you've done so many different shows. Do you have some nuggets that nobody has ever heard come out of your mouth? <laughs> yeah, we will. Uh, you know, when it's your own show, you gotta 
you know, you got to pull out everything, pull out all the stops. So, you know, we will. So I've got some, um, I actually got a couple of them already, uh, already in the can that, you know, we started, we, we've been already been working on it and I've got, you know, a handful of other ones scheduled. Like I said, it's going to be a really good mix, uh, all in all. And, and we're going to have some, we're going to have some good stuff that you just don't normally see on a, on a fishing show. Do you know where it's airing yet? Or is that still to be decided? It's on the outdoor channel. Awesome. Awesome. YouTube, a big thing for you. Um, and I've noticed it. I don't know if everybody else has noticed it. I'm sure they have, but dude, you retired and put all your energy into creating content. Your YouTube's a lot more active. I'm assuming that that's going to continue on. Yeah. You know, in this, in this day and age, um, it's really, you know, all the, you have to cover all the platforms, you know, television, linear television, like the outdoor channel is, is still, um, you know, a very viable place, but I mean, a lot of people watch stuff, on YouTube now, so you've got to have it. You got to have it in all, you know, really all places. So we're going to have a lot of content on our, you know, social platforms on our YouTube channel, and then obviously we'll have, you know, the television show. So you have to really build content for all all those platforms. Well, I've been a big fan of the KVD experience um, my whole life, and and I've experienced some good times with you. I can't wait to see what you put on camera. I know you're busy today. You got all this news coming out. You got the freaking Red Crest. Go win that. Yeah, I mean, it would be the fairy tale ending. Um, you know, it's it's going to be a, a fun event because Lay Lake is a, you know, it's a unique fishery, um, you know, with spotted bass and largemouth both and the time of the year and the conditions and, um, and all, you know, everything with forward-facing sonar right now. You're going to see... You're going to see a real mix here. I think this one, this one could be a really exciting one. Um, you know, as a fan first, because I am. This it's going to be really interesting to see how this one shakes out. You know, I just finished up three days of practice there, and you know, I've done a little bit of all of it, and I'm just trying to decide which way. You know, where to where to focus. You know, where to focus. So, and I think a lot of the anglers are going to be are going to be that same way, and it'll be. Uh, it's going to be an interesting one to watch for sure. Well, go go win that, and I'll, I'll see you next week at the Classic, and uh, we'll toast either your victory there or the launching of your new show. But there's we always find something to freaking toast. You, yeah, it, it's it's a this is a great you know two weeks for bass fishing fans with the Red Crest being this week and the, uh, in Birmingham, and then uh, the Classic in Tulsa it just. Two unbelievable bass fishing towns, and to have this much bass fishing going on, and, and that it's going to be really a great couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to it. All right, dude. We'll we'll chat soon. Thanks for doing this. You bet. Yeah, we'll we'll do we'll get a a little longer version. Get back on the podcast before you know it, man. Yeah, Always love it. Yeah, we'll do that after these couple of weeks. There you have it. Thanks, dude. Talk to you later. The one and only Kevin Van Dam made his announcement today, and I get it. I mean, there was a lot of rumors flying around where people were like, oh, he's going to do this, he's going to do that. I'm excited to see it. I mean, because one thing I'll tell you about Kevin Van Dam, I mean, I consider myself really lucky to call him one of my best friends. And one thing about him, you've seen it in tournaments. You've seen it... Um, <clears throat> at trade shows. I mean, you hear pros talk about it. Nobody outworks KVD at ICAST or anything. Nobody outworks KVD at cooking breakfast when you're on vacation. Nobody outworks KVD at any of those things. I mean, he is just one of those rabid competitors. He puts his all into everything. And I would imagine that the KVD experience, Kevin Van Dam experience, I'm not sure which... One of those it is, um, either or, I mean, is going to be just like that. I can't wait to see, you know, you think of how good some of the videos and, and shows we've seen of Kevin in the past. 
that's when he's doing it like part time. When he's trying to like squeeze it in between a tournament, like day after the tournament, we're gonna quickly shoot a show or we're gonna fit it in here. Or there. Like his schedule is ridiculous. But I think when we get an opportunity to see Kevin Van Dam throw his all and his might behind a TV show, um, maybe not good luck for my TV show, but <laughs> or any others. But it is awesome for fishing fans because uh, it's just another layer of um, Kevin Van Dam that gets revealed. So congrats to the whole Van Dam family. Um, awesome announcement. Awesome show coming up. And I thank him for squeezing in a little time to talk about it. But, man, he's right. We got a lot of great stuff ahead. And um, I, I'm still in awe that we pulled off this show. I mean, we have... <laughs> The biggest bass ever caught on live by Justin Hamner. I mean, and that 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 went a lot of places. Sorry, Mr. Hamner. Uh, not meaning Justin, meaning his dad. Um, I didn't tell him to say that stuff. Then we get Rick Clun, a four-time classic champion. Then we get Kevin Van Dam, a four-time classic champion. I mean, it is freaking ridiculous. What world am I living in? But I appreciate you guys for tuning in and for following along. I'll put all the info for KVD's YouTube and, and Rick Clunge YouTube and everybody's YouTube in the contacts. Make sure you follow that along. Not contacts. What is it? In the comments or the description. That's it. Um, for a guy who talks for a living, I should be better at it. But what a show. What incredible guests. And what incredible viewers you guys are. I thank you, each and every one of you, for tuning in every single week. And as always, Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You.